Welcome to episode 206 of the Ski Podcast, and thanks for joining us, listener. Today, we are going to be discussing Verbier, Saalbach, and the impact of climate change on ski resorts. Plus, we're going to be having a discussion about Vale Resorts and the Epic Pass as a consequence of uh, episode 204. Now, my name's Ian Martin. I'd like to introduce my guest today. I'm delighted to welcome back to the show freelance journalist and regular guest, Catherine Murphy. Catherine was last on the show in episode 173 when she was telling us about paid ejects. Hi, Catherine. How are you? Hi, Ian. I'm good. I'm in Dublin at the moment. I'm just back from skiing in val in the haute Marianne in France, where we had amazing snow conditions. I'll be very interested to uh, hear about that. I think we're going to cover val in one of the future episodes of the podcast. And for the first time on the show, joining direct from France, we have David George, founder of the PisteOr.com website. Hi, David. How are you and where are you? Hi, I'm uh, near Grenoble, so in the French Alps. I'm uh, very well, thank you. Nice to meet you. Now, a question I always like to ask my guests uh, to start off with is, when did you ski or snowboard last? Catherine, I think I probably know the answer to this already based on what you just told me, but when was that? It was literally, it was last week, Ian, and they had had just almost two metres of snow just before we arrived, so we had fantastic conditions. Excellent. And sorry, that was in val which is in the haute Morienne, is that right? That's correct, in France, yeah. So we were skiing. Val we went ski touring in Bonval sur Arc, which is absolutely beautiful, up to the glacier de Vallonay, and we just had a spectacular time skiing, powder in the trees, um, amazing. Best conditions of the season for me. Excellent. And I know you get to go away quite a lot. So if you had the best snow of the season, then you certainly time that well. Uh, David, what about yourself? When was the last time you were on snow? Uh, exactly the same, a week ago, but that was cross country skiing in the Massif Central. That was at the Col de Loge. And uh, I think the snow that uh, Catherine got was the same snow we got uh, because it was a big storm that went through the southern outs and then came back, dumped a load of snow on the border with France, Italy. And sorry, you said you were cross-country skiing. Are you also skiing on the mountain this winter as well? Uh, not since Christmas because I broke my leg just after Christmas and I've been off for two and a half months. OK, I'm sorry to hear that. You're building yourself <laughs> back into it with cross-country That's skiing, right. are you? That's right, yeah. OK, well, I hope that continues to go well. My last time on snow was in Ver- I was there last week, so I guess Thursday was my last day of skiing. I also, like Catherine, was blessed with some great conditions. Certainly not two metres of uh, snow, but some really good fresh powder off peak. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But conditions have changed a little bit uh, since then. And I do have a few snow reports, so let's have a listen to them. Hey, Ian and the Ski Podcast. Uh, it's lovely to be back in your ears again with a snow forecast from La Plan. This is Jen. And I am stood on my balcony in some hot, hot, sunny weather. It is at prey ski time and it is very spring-like here in La Plan. Um, so the warm weather has really firmly set in. Um, sadly, what that meant at the start of this week is that we did have some rain um, up to about 2,000 metres on Monday instead of the forecast snow, which was a bit of a shame. Um, but thankfully after Monday it has the clouds have cleared it has stayed warm but we've had glorious bluebeard skies and the ski conditions have actually been really really nice the snow conditions obviously struggled um, kind of from the mid levels and lower down they're definitely a lot lot softer than they were the pistes I would still say they're really not patchy um, at all but the sides of the pistes are looking very patchy and as you head down lower into the valley villages which head all the way down to like 1200 meters here at Mont Chavan and Lacoche and Champigny level um, the pistes are being kept in kept open and kept in good condition but the sides of the pistes are looking very very green now um, but if you head up higher so up higher than 2000 meters the rain did turn to snow so up at kind of the Roche de Mio level and up to the glacier at the Life 3000, there was fresh snow. So it was really, really nice up there on Tuesday. The glacier lift was also closed because of the high winds and, and the weather. It meant that Tuesday morning skiers got some really nice conditions. If you are looking for the firmest snow, definitely now it's heading up high. It's heading out early. Um, those north facing slopes, they're definitely maintaining their structure a lot longer. Um, fortunately, it is pretty quiet now. We had a really, really hectic February half term. And I say February half term, but it was, to be honest, 
the entire month of February and the first week of March as well as the Belgian holidays really hit us hard as well but thankfully mid-March and the end of March is looking really peaceful. As we look towards spring uh, kind of really into Easter holidays as well we're starting to see a lot of ski tour operators and that's starting to offer discounts and things like that and everyone's getting really excited for the longer sunny weather so there's definitely still a lot of fun to be had out on the slopes. We're open here in La Plan until the 28th of April so there's still so much of the season to go. I think that's like five weeks of skiing to go. So even though it's spring equinox, so it's officially the start of spring today, there's still lots of the ski season to enjoy. So I'm going to sign off from my sunny balcony here in La Plan and maybe I'll see you on the slopes before the end of the season. Take care. Bye. Hi Ian, it's Bethany sending you a snow report from the Mont Blanc Valley. So we earlier this week we had quite a lot of precipitation on Sunday night into Monday but unfortunately the snow line was pretty high so rain did fall up to above 2,000 metres. Saying that, I skied Grand Montaigne Chamonix on Tuesday and there was a lot of snow up high and the piece um, are skiing well, they're a bit icy first thing but they do soften up. The piece are going to stay in good condition for a while because there is such a, a lot of snow up there the lower slopes um in Chamonix fine I'm currently looking at the lower slopes of Saint Gervais and Combleu and unfortunately the snow is disappearing quite quickly because it's been very warm since uh the rain on Monday we've had some really high temperatures but do you know what higher up the they're doing a good job to keep the piece open um, and if you're going to Chamonix then there's so much high terrain that actually uh, it's skiing really well so my advice is early in the morning quite icy afternoon softening up there's that um, lovely part of the middle of the day when it's skiing really well and yeah you know it's March it's middle of March already so you know it's spring skiing what else can you expect you know any day on the mountain is a good day so anyone heading out for Easter holidays I'm sure you'll have a great time enjoy thanks Ian till next time hi Ian once again, the ever-dependable 150 days of winter has been called in for a last-minute Three Valleys snow report. With only one month left of the winter season in Courchevel, you can definitely say that spring has sprung. With very soft conditions underfoot, it's definitely time to try getting up for first lifts. With recent snowfalls only affecting upper slopes and by extension high resorts like Val the lower slopes in the afternoon require a paddle instead of a pole. Even with some small falls forecast, this winter isn't going to be endless. On a recent visit to the ice caves of Valteren, the fresh snow was plentiful, creating a much reduced entrance to the grotto. Likewise, the snow on the piece in the VT are the envy of its neighbours. And with that blatant plug to my most recent video, it's time to open the rosé and enjoy the sunshine. Ciao! Thanks to Jen, Bethany and Alex for those snow reports. So there's still a few weeks of the season left in most ski resorts, uh, even up to six in some if you're going to somewhere like Val Terrens or Val d'Isere. So if you are heading to the snow listener, don't forget you can save money when you book your ski hire at intersportrent.com and use the code ski podcast. Uh, that will give you a guaranteed discount on all ski hire in France, Austria and Switzerland. And as it goes, you don't even need to use that code. You can just take the link in the show notes and that discount will automatically be applied and the basket reduced. A quick shout out while we're talking about uh, ski hire to Philip Rue uh, in sport in Verbiate. I needed some touring skis while I was there. They gave me a pair of Vocal Blaze. They were great off piece, very light uh, going up as well. So uh, thank you to them. A little bit of news Team GB, Charlotte Banks, the snowboard cross athlete, picked up her fifth consecutive uh, podium. She got a first in Sierra Nevada, followed by a second in Montefon, uh, and she is third overall in the World Cup standings. Dave Riding finished the season seventh overall in Slalom, uh, 15th in the finals at Salbach. And Jasmine Taylor, uh, I would say Britain's greatest ever racer on skis, been on the podcast many times, most recently in episode uh, 200, picked up three more podiums uh, in Lavigno. She goes into the finals which are coming up this weekend, I think, in first place. Right, we're going to move on to uh, Saalbach. 
And one of the reasons I wanted to ask you on the show, Catherine, I know that recently you've been in Valsani, but I mentioned that you've been traveling around all over the place. You were in Saalbach earlier this season. Do you just want to tell us uh, when you were there? Well, actually, I was just there a few weeks ago, Ian. I had uh, I switched between Saalbach and I went over to the Gastein Valley, both, re- both areas in Salzburgerland region. I think I'm right in saying that the uh, World Cup finals, when I mentioned Dave Riding just then, they took place in Saalbach. Yeah, they're actually still there, continuing until the 24th. So as we speak, the World Cup finals are taking place and Saalbach, Hinterglem are preparing for for the uh, World Ski Championships uh, next February 2025. Uh, great excitement about that event happening. Were you there while the World Cup finals were going on? No, I was there at the very end of February, just to, onto the, the 1st of March. Um, so the World Cup finals started, I think, mid, mid-March. mid Okay, and what kind of preparation are you seeing for the World Championships coming up next year then? Well, we're see- I mean, I know some of your listeners have spoken before about the great uh, modern lift infrastructure in Selbach, Hinterglem. The full name, Ian, actually is Salbach Kinterglem Leogang Fieberbrunn uh, Ski Circus, quite a mouthful, <laughs> but uh, commonly called Salbach Kinterglem or Salbach or the Ski Circus. So they've already updated the Limburg lift. Um, it's gone from being a four-man lift or a four-person lift to an eight, eight-seater eight lift. I think after 29 years and 15 million passengers, that lift has been up, upgraded. They have put in a new pedestrian bridge to make access easier for people because when the World Championships happen, um, they want to encourage people to, to walk. They're taking a very sustainable approach to the event. They want to actually, they're aiming for an international sustainability certification with the World Championships. They want to encourage people to walk and to ski and so that people will be able to ski and watch the races uh, from the sidelines in Hinterglem. So, yeah, lots of they're also upgrading an emergency access road, which is very important, actually, for safety and security. OK, I can imagine that um, the atmosphere will be great. I went to the uh, Chamonix, the Kandahar World Cup in Chamonix, and it's my first time ever at a World Cup race. And the atmosphere was brilliant there. Yet I understand that there were very few people there compared with the kind of turnout that you get in Austria. So basically, there are going to be 11 races on one mountain. Um, the Zwolferkogel in Hinterglem. There are going to be 600 athletes from 75 nations and they're expecting around 15,000 people to book tickets to be in the, you know, the final, the arena to watch the, the racers come in and to, for people to spot their favourite racers. So, yeah, 15,000, but many more people watching on the slopes from the sidelines. There's a history of being a spectator for ski racing in Austria that other countries don't quite have. For example, Kitzbühel, you know, we see the crowd at the bottom of that. But famously, those Schladming night races. Just out of interest, do you know if any of those Salvak races are planned for the evening? No, not that I'm aware of, because I was looking at the event um, schedule, well, the different races yesterday, and I haven't noticed any that are nighttime. I may be wrong. People can find your information as time goes by on Salvak2025.com for more detailed information. Let's Let's go back a little bit then to Saalbach. Um, we discussed like when you went there. Whereabouts is it in Austria? How, how do you get to it? So it's in Salz- the Salzburgerland region. It's about an hour, an hour and a half from Salzburg airport. That's the nearest airport. Um, but actually, some of the time when you're skiing in Saalbach, Hinterglem, you're actually skiing on the Salzburgerland Tyrol border. So it's kind of bordering those two regions. Okay, so you're flying into Salzburg, and how far is it from the from the airport there? Less than one and a half, around one and a half, or maybe one hour twenty minutes. So it is possible to take a shared shuttle, kind of low cost or affordable, with a company called Austria Transfer, AustriaTransfer dot com. But you can also take the train. So if you land at Salzburg Airport, you've got to get to the train station. I think that's around a 20-minute bus ride, possibly. And then you can take the train to ZLMC. As it goes, I know that you can get there by train from the UK because I recently posted a case study on the Ski Flight Free website about uh, a chap who who did that journey with his son. And it was a bit complicated, but he didn't have any problem doing it. And he actually got there earlier than the uh, other people in his group who booked a uh, package. So in terms of the resort itself, then, I have actually been to Salbach. I went there quite a long time ago, probably the year 2000 or so, I would guess. And I went there when the British University Ski Championships were held there. So it was probably, it was quite a wild week and maybe not quite representative of uh, normal. But if I recall correctly, the resort itself is maybe like around a thousand or maybe 1100 meters is that right saddleback resort village is at 1000 meters so basically the the ski circus has 270 kilometers of pistes 
about 70 lifts and 60 cozy mountain huts, many of which um, are for apres ski. In <laughs> it has a big, a good apres ski reputation. Um, can't remember the question you just asked me there. Right, you mentioned apres ski. I mean, Austria definitely has a reputation for apres ski in a different kind of way from uh, France and Switzerland. It's more like apres starts immediately after skiing, or maybe three in the afternoon, that type of thing. Are there those type of bars like I'm thinking of St. Anton and Ischgl, et cetera, Meyerhof, and where they're halfway up the mountain? Yeah, I think I might describe Salbach as maybe a mini Ischgl. It definitely has a very lively apre ski scene. And post-COVID, I'm sure you've talked about this before, some resorts have maybe been trying to move away from that model. But in Salbach, I spoke to the tourist board and they said, no, we embrace our apre ski scene. We were very good at it. Point I'll make is that actually when I was in Salbach at the end of February, some of the lifts were opening at 8 a.m. So by, you know, somewhere 8 a.m., somewhere 8.30, somewhere 9 a.m. But by 3 p.m., 3.30, 4 p.m., yeah, definitely everyone's ready to be in the in the bars. And I suppose we're talking about bars like Soul House, off Peter, which is in Salbach Village. A very famous one is the Hinterhag Alm, which is uh, famous for live music, and that's on the slopes. And I suppose the live music starts there at around 4 p.m. Oh, wait, it sounds like you tested them all out there, Catherine. (laughs) Salbach Hinterglem, then. They are two different villages that are kind of joined they're, but they're very close together it's almost like the same conurbation if you wanted to use that yeah, term I suppose, yeah i suppose people talk about Salbach hinterglem uh, together really and then leo gang and fever run who would you say Salbach is suitable for then as we're saying like the slopes are like 52 percent blue over 40 percent red and just seven percent black slopes the other very important point to make is that via the alpencard lift pass uh, Salbach Hinterglem Ski Circus is linked, largely linked to Zellumsee and Caprun to the Kishtine Horn Glacier, offering a total of 408 kilometres of peace. Isn't that quite a distance away from Salbach? If you went to Salbach, would you really go over there to ski as well? I think people do, yeah. If you're staying in Salbach and you want to ski over the over the, the Zellumsee side, you've got to ski down to, my pronunciation is probably terrible, to the Weyhoven slope, and then you take a lift up to uh the Schmittenhoe in Zellum Sea. On the return journey, you take a lift back down and you've got to take a short bus ride. It's not 100% linked. And the point to make is that whether or not you decide to ski over in Zellum Sea or Caprun, you must buy the Alpencard lift pass, which costs around 377 euros for six days. So there is no separate ski circus lift pass. It's one lift pass covering uh, the three different resorts oh, you've got the lift pass anyway so you're saying maybe you might as well try it absolutely and i was very keen to do that during my visit but the weekend i was there it was just before a lot of areas got new snow that that one run that we needed to take wasn't open on that particular day we would have had to t- have taken two buses which i didn't really want to do but if if i go back another time i will do it oh thanks so much for that Catherine. i really enjoyed finding out about Salbach there right i'm going to move on to verbier next i mentioned that last week i was in verbier And that really is a free ride paradise. Um, I can't believe the luck I've uh, had. It's actually the second year in a row I've been there. And on both occasions, I've had amazing snow. I say I found the snow or I had the snow. I need to give a a huge shout out to the two guides who took me out. Uh, Anthony Voot from uh, European Snow Sport and Bernard uh, Bertrand Lovey, who's a guide with the ski school La Fantastique. Uh, Day one, went to Bruson. Never skied in Bruson before did laps of what they call the Canadian trees, this beautiful larch forest uh, on skiers right as you're coming down in Bruce on. Uh, Then a short uh, 30 minute ski tour. We went up uh, from the top of the uh, the Grand Side button lift to Cis Blanc. That's 2,445 metres and had a beautiful pitch uh, back down. A really fantastic uh, day of skiing. And an area of Verbier that isn't really, isn't really ski by most people who go on holiday there. I mean, lots of the locals, know it particularly uh, well but um these days you can actually just catch that gondola straight down to la chabla straight up on the other side they've it's been uh, replaced three years ago the gondola itself and then the chairlifter two years ago and very quickly you can be up at the top of a uh, bruce on it's also north facing as well so some really good options there for off piece and then day two went off the back of montfort what you probably call like the classic uh, off-piste skiing in Verbier. Really a fantastic pitch. You've got a little 
kind of section which uh, always concentrates the mind because it's a no fall zone to start off with then we did a uh, short boot pack up quite a uh, steep section and then another beautiful clear pitch with unskied powder i do have a bit of a video which i'll drop into the uh, show notes and then we came back on a, a long ski out you know really i just love verbier i wish i could uh, probably go back every season and several times a season certainly if they're going to get the snow that uh, was delivered at the time uh, as well as a guide i'd like to give a quick shout out and say thanks to robin shah uh, he is a listener of the podcast. He joined me every day on the hill. He has great knowledge of the backcountry, and Verbier was great to ski uh, with him. He was really helpful to chat to, to give me a bit of inside information. It is such an amazing playground. The Free Ride World Tour Finals are held there every year. They have incredibly good riders uh, in the area. Uh, Catherine, I think I'm right in saying that you were out there last year, or you've certainly been out there before for the Free Ride World Tour Finals. Yes, indeed, Ian. I was there at the end of last March. Unfortunately, they had to postpone the finals due to weather conditions. Weather conditions was just wild. We spent a morning sitting in the Blacktop restaurant, sitting next to all the free ride competitors while we waited to see whether the event was going to, the race was going to go ahead. Maybe that in itself was quite thrilling, being next to the riders. While I was in Verbier, Vincent Delarue clinched the free ride world tour title for the third time. I think actually skiing over in Austria, Fieber Brunnen, as you mentioned, uh, Catherine. Seriously, if you've never watched any footage on the free ride world tour, you should uh, have a look. I'll put a link in to the uh, show notes. The force runs strong in his family, as I'm sure many listeners will know. His older brother, Xavier, also won it uh, three times. He is a very interesting man. He's based in Verbier, and I was lucky enough to interview him last week while I was there. I'm going to release that as a special uh, episode in an, a few weeks' time, and you can find out about the backcountry camp that he was running, uh, his recent trip to Antarctica, and his daughter, who is 18 who is also a free ride world tour skier on the challenger circuit, uh, except that she is a skier. And, uh, you know, you could find that she will be the third of the Delarue family to pick up a title uh, down the track. Now, another reason I was in Verbier was to find out more about what the resort is doing in, in terms of sustainability. Uh, I travelled by train, and that works so well from the UK to Verbier, principally because of Le Chable, which is the hub at the bottom of the mountain you get off the train you walk around the corner for a couple of minutes and get straight onto the gondola and go up to verbier itself that took nine and a half hours uh, from london a couple of changes along the way but it's just so straightforward and there is actually uh, an app that verbier have set up called go verbier which allows you if you're an international visitor to go and look at the relative impact of each form of travel but that changing in le chable makes so much difference and on top of that you know verbier like a lot of alpine resorts it's blessed with great hydroelectric power they've also got some solar power so almost all of the lifts are run on renewables the uh, research by uh, predictile winters uh, showed that the actual kit you use represents about 12 percent of your carbon footprint when you go on a ski holiday and something that i'd never tried before but which was really interesting in verbier was i tried out a new business called circle clothing and they rent out ski clothing. Uh, so I spoke to the founder, Anders Bergenstrand. Let's have a listen to that. Right, I'm uh, sitting here in Verbier with uh, Anders Berg Bergenstrand. Uh, really nice to meet you, Anders. You're the founder you. of Circle Clothing. Um, I wondered if you could just tell me, in simple terms, what Circle Clothing is. Um, so what we do in simple terms is that we offer like to use the skiers, the opportunity to rent rather than to purchase the ski clothing. And you book it online like a normal e-commerce store, but instead of purchasing it at checkout, you tell us where you're going, and then we deliver it to your accommodation. Well, that's exactly yeah. what you've done for me right now, because I had a look at the website prior to coming, and I ordered my different uh, items, and you've delivered them. I'm going to try them on uh, a little bit uh, later on. How long have you been running the business? So this is our second official commercial season. So, for three years. We, we tried it three seasons ago. And we're in Verbier now, but the service itself extends to, what, everywhere it's, in Switzerland? It's a Swiss-wide service. So, the idea, the idea is, I mean, obviously, I understand that the, the circular economy, and the, the name kind of fits into that really well. But circular economy is, you know, a really key part of sustainability. And I think we've seen a real shift in consumer behaviour in the last few years, where people are much more inclined to be prepared to rent different items and that includes clothing uh, as well have you found the response so far it's been a great response to be honest i think it's a 
it's a service that people might not really be aware that it exists. So for us, it's, it's all about making sure that the communication is out there and that people hear about this opportunity. Then it's something that is fairly new in the market. It takes time for people to adapt. You know, you already rent your skis and boots, so why, why shouldn't you rent your clothing? Yeah, well, we were talking a little bit before, and I think you said to me that uh, maybe 60% of people are used to renting skis and boots already, so yep. it would make sense. Because there's a lot of convenience to it, isn't there? I mean, for example, if you don't have to pack up your ski pants and your jacket and your layers, etc., then that's a lot of uh, um, baggage that you don't need to bring with you when you come on your ski holiday. Yeah, for sure. And especially, if, think about it, if you're a full family, travelling with children, that's a lot of things that you need to bring with you. And, uh, you know, with the cost of uh, a carriage on planes these days for the extra bags, whether it's a small bag or a large bag, that can be factored into the cost as well. You, you mentioned um, kids. You know, I've got teenage uh, kids, and as they've been growing, we would definitely always try and borrow stuff if we could, because it's not really worth buying for them. Do, have you got a lot of kids stuff in stock? Do you find there's demand for that? We, we, we do have a lot of kids wear. And I, I, I would almost say that it's the main driver of our business at the moment, where a lot of families find our service and, and think of exactly like, like how you mentioned it. So with all of the brands that you stock, how do you choose what it is that you're going to be offering people? If we look from a brand perspective, we work with brands who have a very high sustainability profile, um, because of course is very important still how the product is produced yeah. even if you're renting it from us um, and I think if you are a brand that have a high sustainability profile you're also more likely to embrace the type of business model we offer so what kind of brands do you have in stock then? we currently work with uh, Patagonia Picture Organic Clothing Swedish Houdini the Hester Gloves and uh, we work with a Swiss uh, kids clothing brand called Namuk yeah, uh, that's more local here, but uh, doing a, think about it like a Patagonia for kids. Okay, excellent. It. I mean, I've heard of all of those brands apart from Houdini. Obviously, Patagonia, kind of everybody knows, I think. And Picture Organic, you know, I've interviewed the guys from Picture Organic before on the podcast, have really high standards. Where's Houdini from? Houdini is Swedish. Um, in terms of the idea behind it because to me it seems like an, an obvious thing to do and I'm almost surprised I mean that, there are a few companies in the UK that are doing it now there's a there's a big brand called Her there's also a company called Eco Ski in yep. the UK that rent out uh, clothing but you, you said you started it several seasons ago what was your motivation for starting the business? I was very inspired actually by a circular business model in the fashion industry and, and could see that this wasn't particularly well developed in the outdoor industry. And, and if you think about it, it's, it makes so much more sense actually for an outdoor product that you don't use that often. So that was the main inspiration for it. What were you doing beforehand? Uh, my background is from the fashion industry, in my professional life. So I guess that helps with an understanding of supply lines and things like that. Yeah, certainly. You know, you have been able to rent your ski clothing in, in various ski rental shops, um, but the assortment isn't particularly premium. Yeah. It's not that attractive. Yeah, it's and often I, like that, isn't yeah, it? You and know I, that. I think this is what's missing, right? Because people demand this. And, 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 you know, even if you rent something, you want it to still be a premium experience. And so the brands that you're talking about, you know, the good quality clothing. Now, we are here in, in Verbier, and, you know, it's true to say that it's not the, the least expensive resort to, uh, to <laughs> ski in Europe. Yeah. I'm guessing that some of the people who come to Verbier, you know, they can afford to buy whatever they want. Do you think that's affecting demand or are they still as keen to rent clothing? I think they are because for us convenience is really the main driver behind this and these are still customers who see convenience in their life. So I think even if you can afford to purchase the products, rental is still an attractive option for you. And what about, do you ever get anyone, uh, you know, coming in who wants to rent, you know, several jackets for the week so they can just like change up and... I, I, I'll try to be diplomatic and say like this, it's not something that we encourage, but of course it happens. Yes. Cool. Well, I mean, that's brilliant, Anders. I'm looking forward to trying the kit myself and I'll, I'll report on that. But I just think it's a brilliant idea. Really good. And so I'll put a link into the show notes so people can find out more about it. And, you know, as you said, people don't necessarily understand. So that's the whole point of us talking about Absolutely. it now. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much.
And as well as Anders, who's a fascinating man, he used to work for Hugo Boss in the fashion industry and just decided he wanted to do something a bit more meaningful. Anna Smoothie is another co-founder. Uh, she's an ex-free ride world tour skier. Uh, she's one of the team at Circle. And she's done research on the carbon footprint of renting that shows it's 76% less than if you buy. So, you know, I highly recommend this service. It's not cheap. But it's very efficient. It's a bit like uh, hiring your skis and boots. You basically get very good new equipment. You don't have to pack as much to take with you. I guess you can take off a little bit of the cost from the bags that you don't need to uh, rent, uh, etc. Probably not so good if you're like skiing a lot every winter. But if you're someone who only goes out once, certainly if you've got kids, that can be a very efficient and sustainable way of doing it. Now, while in Verbi, I also met up with another entrepreneur who's providing sustainable solutions. Uh, he is Josh Speller from Verbier Green. Let's have a listen to that conversation. Well, I'm sitting here in Verbier on a beautifully sunny day uh, in mid-March with uh, Josh Speller from the founder of Verbier Green. Hi, Josh. How are you? Hey there. Very good, thanks. Thanks for taking some time uh, out of your day today. I know you've been busy this morning. You've been doing the rounds. I wonder if you could just kind of explain for the listener what it is that Verbier Green does. Yeah, sure. What we do is we basically provide efficient uh, waste transportation and sorting for hotels, bars, restaurants. Um, in order to understand what we do, you sort of have to understand uh, the recycling system here in Verbier. So the premise is all on the individual to take their waste to the individual recycling points. For example, we're sitting here at the uh, eight bed and bar and the bar outside. They've got loads of bottles, they gather loads of glass every uh, week, but there's no bin for them to put it into right next to their property. So either they drive all the way down to the local recycling centre, but it's a lot more time efficient for you to do that for them. Totally, and I guess one of the most important things is most bars and then restaurants here don't have a vehicle in the first place. So if you don't have a vehicle, if you don't have a large waste area, if you don't have a slight, large number of staff, and if you don't have the time, it's incredibly difficult to recycle properly. So with us, instead, we provide you with a colour-coded, easy-to-use system in French, Swedish and English, <laughs> uh, depending on where you're, where you're from. And then we come by as many times a week as you need, and we take the uh, materials and provide you with completely empty, clean uh, containers for the following evening. Cool. And just to put that in context, there are no black bags, you were saying, here in no, Verbier. People have exactly. to buy an official white bag and just put their rubbish in that. Yeah, exactly. So the official white bags for the large ones cost you 54 francs for a roll of 10. So you're looking at about 5 francs 40 per bag. What was sort of happening for a number of clients is that they would put many materials maybe they would recycle their glass and their cardboard because it's a bit easier but then things like pet bottles and cans would end up going in the white sack and then they'd just take that to the bin because it's easy and they don't have the ability to recycle it and you were saying with black sacks you know if they find uh, like a black sack they'll kind of go through it to work out who it's from and then find them yeah so the black sacks end up at a private dump down the valley um they all all of the black and white sacks basically end up in the same place um, they will then open that and if they find a black sack they will go through it and if they find something with your name on then they will find it. <laughs> right okay so there's obviously an incentive from a, a time point of view to work with you with Verbier Green and not only are you doing you know cardboard, paper, glass, plastic but you've been working with the uh, chalet companies in terms of their bio waste. Yep exactly so this is a really cool project that we started a couple years ago where you can uh, recycle food waste in Verbier if you can fill up um, a large 140 litre wheelie bin every week and then that will get emptied by a private company. Now of course if you're a standalone chalet it's very very difficult to provide that much food waste in one week. So therefore what we did is we rented uh, multiple of these wheelie bins and put them at our warehouse and then we provide multiple clients, chalet companies, individual chalets with a, a smaller container for the kitchen and for outside. They then decant that and we then collect it as many times a week as we need, sometimes once a week, sometimes three and then we uh, consolidate all of that into our bins that we rented down at our warehouse. Great. So they wouldn't be able to do that themselves because of the scale, but it's going down into the valley and the company who handle it all down there are then using that bio waste to create energy off that? Yeah, so it gets turned into two things. It either gets turned into compost and a fertiliser for the fields here, or even better, it gets turned into biodiesel for the tractors around Valais. So now 
individual chalets and then the chalet company's food wastes instead of just going straight into the bin in a linear waste system. Now their own food waste is now powering and providing fuel for the farmers all, all around Valais. Yeah, well, I mean, it's brilliant, Josh, the work that you're doing. And how long's the business been going? Uh, this is our sixth winter. Right, your sixth winter. And uh, from the sounds of it, you know, you're uh, busy in picking up more clients uh, all the way through. Always trying, always trying. <laughs> well, that's brilliant. Thanks for sharing your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much. So with this conversation about sustainability, you know, we talked about the, the weather with our snow reports. I'd like to bring in David from Peace Store. We're going to be discussing the changing climate, but I wonder if I could ask you first about the Peace Store website. You know, wh- why and when did you found, found it? OK, the first articles on the site are from the early 90s, but the actual site and the main name has existed since 2004. My interest is in ski touring and off-piece skiing. I wanted to give a bit more information on uh, the risks of, of that activity, especially with respect to avalanches, but also other risks like falls, snow conditions, etc. And at the time I set it up, there wasn't a great deal of information. I mean, the web was in its infancy at the time. You know, there was a lot of uh, emphasis on free riding but not on the dangers the period that you're talking about is when we've seen a lot of changes uh, on the skis so the fatter skis have really yeah. allowed a lot of people to access the back country and i think that probably people were maybe going ahead of their ability levels and certainly ahead of their knowledge levels yeah certainly that would have been the case at the time you know things have come on a lot of, a long way since since that time uh, a lot of books have been published and a lot of guide people like uh, you've mentioned Xavier de Leroux, people like that have uh, done education they've done youtube videos so it's all part of that so there's, a, there's certainly today there's a lot more information out there when i do publish that Xavier de la Rue interview listeners you will hear that and you may already know this that he had an almost fatal uh, accident in an avalanche and that completely changed his view about risk And one of the things he likes to uh, stress is that, you know, being a bit afraid, having some paranoia, having some fear is actually a good thing because it helps you make better decisions. One of the things he was stressing to me is that don't be in a rush. You know, when we were in Verbier, it was really interesting to watch people trying to, you know, take the first lift as we were up to Montfort, but then run when they get from the top of the jumbo to get over to the Montfort lift so they can be the first people up there. His thing is all about take it easy, take your time, you know, make your decisions. And in terms of the kind of uh, content that you're putting out onto uh, P-Store, David, that's a, the, the type of thing, trying to inform people a little bit more? Exactly. Well, the effect you've just talked about, and we call that powder frenzy. I mean, it's like a drug. You know, people are going for that rush. And as you say, you need to back off a little bit. In fact, you need to be doing your planning and thinking before you get anywhere near the slopes. You need to be doing things like reading the Avalanche Bulletin, which is published the day before, and then thinking about where you're going to go to based on that information. Well, we could turn um, a discussion about how to avoid avalanches and uh, uh, the assessment of risk in terms of avalanches into a whole podcast but actually the reason that i wanted to have you on the podcast uh, today is to do with a a really interesting blog post you wrote about weather and snow trends uh, in the alp you know the conversation in verbier and in a lot of the industry right now is kind of broadly uh, shrunk down to low bad high good (laughs) unfortunately we've seen this winter the rain snow line level going up and up the uh, mountain and I often hear people saying uh, things like, oh, it's just weather. But, you know, weather is what you see when you look out the window. The data over a longer term is what I'm more interested in. And that is not just the weather. And the, in the blog post that you wrote, you were looking at a lot of data from uh, Meteo France. And I wondered if you could just tell me a little bit more about that. As you say, places like Verbier and the big Savoyard resorts are somewhat insulated from uh, what's been going on this year. And also last year, it was the same. We've uh, had two years where the average temperatures have been three degrees above average. Now, that's a short term climate effect. The long term climate effect is that in France, we're about two degrees above the pre-industrial average of temperatures. And in the Alps, we're actually higher than that. We're getting closer to 2.3, 2.4 degrees 
above the pre-industrial average. You may remember that we fixed an objective not to go above 1.5 degrees, but that's global. So that includes oceans, everything. Here we're talking about continental temperatures. So we've already pushed through that level. Two degrees is, in simple terms, 300 metres higher snow line. That is actually a really brutal and very clear way of uh, putting it. What you're saying is what we've seen now, regardless of any kind of future changes, is being reflected in an increase in the uh, the rain snow line of 300 metres. Exactly, yeah, that's an average. But th- the last two winters, we've had overlaid on top of that trend. We've had two winters with another three degrees higher average temperatures. So we've gone from, say, the snow line in the 2010s was about a thousand meters in somewhere like Chamonix. So Chamonix Valley would have snow during a lot of the winter. It's got cross country trails in the valley at that altitude. We've had another three degrees. So we've had a snow line that's been more around about 1500 to 1700 meters the last two winters. Verbier didn't care, Val Terrans, Val de Zer, they're all above that level. In fact, it's a bit of a strange thing. Unlike the, the snow droughts we had at the end of the 80s, which were due to lack of precipitation, we've had a lot of precipitation. So places as Catherine saw in Val uh, which are at a good altitude, also in a very cold valley, have been blitzed with snow. Val, Val de Zer have had record snow levels at some altitudes, Verbier similar. Uh, but lower down, places like the Jura, uh, which is between 1,000 and 1,300 metres, they've hardly had a flake. It's been raining. In fact, they had, at the very start of winter, they had good snowfall in December. But because we've then had this very high-altitude rain, that's been washed away for them. Hasn't affected the, the big ski resorts anywhere near as much. So we've got this short-term trend at the moment. Is it due to El Nino or some other effect? That's uh, another question. Yeah, I mean, that is a a hard one to answer. I was certainly reading about that recently, about uh, the warm African air meeting the cold Arctic air, and that means warm air has been further uh, north this year. We won't know until later about the El Nino effect, but even then, that is a short-term observation of a long-term trend. Another thing I think that we're seeing is these big jumps of temperatures uh, over a short period of time. I think we have one coming coming up this weekend in the outs where currently well we might be seeing like a 14 degree 15 degree change over 24 hours yeah and that's exactly linked into what you've just said uh the americans call this whiplash weather so where we get these jumps cold hot cold hot that we haven't seen and that seems to be due to the fact there's more energy in the system so just another data point as you like them the north atlantic which you mentioned uh is uh, over a degree warmer than normal than the long-term average since 1980 it's a degree above that and that as you said has had the effect of pushing the warm african tropical air further north so places like sweden norway have been less affected this winter by which are fairly low areas but it's pushed the warm air right up to to belgium so rather than just having a gradual warming we've seen a sudden switch with a average three degree temperature rise and also these very extreme events where you get very hot air, very cold air, but also quite a lot of precipitation, which is good for high altitude areas. Yeah, I mean, certainly that backs up the conversations that I was having in Verbio, where people are saying, well, you know, the snow levels, the depths, the snow depths high up are actually, you know, very good. But in in your uh, blog post, you referred to a number of the lower level resorts. And I think that sometimes it can be a bit frustrating because the mainstream press uh, tend to latch on to some of these, you know, very low lying resorts that that have closed for good or are closing. I think probably to most people, it doesn't really mean that much because they're not international destinations. People aren't going there. But the fact is that these resorts are closing and they're the ones that are closing now. And I don't want to be Cassandra, but you don't have to look too far in the future to see that that's going to affect what we would consider to be more mainstream resorts that are a little bit lower in the future. Yeah, the uh, French General Accounting Office had a big report, which has really caused a stir in France with resorts uh, not particularly happy with it. But they've identified these lower resorts, which don't have particularly sound finances. Today, those are closing. Some of them will continue to operate because they can operate, they can switch lifts on when there's snow. But others have invested in bigger infrastructure and they can't sustain that. Uh, so the canary in the coal mine, if you like, there's a resort in the Jura called Meta, Meta Beef or Meta Beef. And there the director has said he's programmed shutting the alpine skiing by 2035. He said it will not be financially sustainable. That's medium 
small medium resort so you're getting a bit bigger the thing that's slightly worrying if you look at the this report that was published and i covered this in the blog post uh since 2010 there's been a bit of an uptick in uh, temperature rises the background rises not the seasonal variations and we're looking at about 0.6 of a degree per decade at the moment if that trend is sustained that's 100 meters tem- uh, snow line rise per decade so today if we say the snow line is around sustainable snow lines around about 1200 meters by 2050 we're looking at a snow line of around 14 to 1500 meters with obviously weather events maybe meaning that we don't get snow below 2000 meters some weekends so as you say it will begin to impact on the big resorts they won't be able to make snow at lower levels that is so interesting david and what i'm going to do is put a link into the show notes to p store and to that specific blog post as well as some of the others as well i do retain optimism although evidently global warming and climate change uh, is definitely happening and it is evidently impacting on skiing there are a lot of great measures uh, going on and individual resorts recognize uh, regular listeners might recall that i had uh, had a feature about les arc just before christmas or one of the things they pointed out then is that for every one person employed on the mountain working on the lifts etc there are five other jobs that are dependent on that and so it is literally an existential issue for ski resorts it's not just about us being able to go on a ski holiday. That is, I guess, a minor factor as well. But I am optimistic that if we as humanity are prepared to, you know, if we have the will, then we can uh, change these things. And on a purely uh, ski level, some great research by Protect Our Winters, I mentioned before, they showed uh, about 12% of your carbon footprint of a holiday is to do with your clothing and your equipment. 66% of that carbon footprint of a ski holiday, if you're coming from the UK, is your flight. And you can immediately reduce that and make your own a contribution to reducing emissions if you choose to travel, for example, by train or in a, a car that has uh, lots of people in it. And there's lots of information about that on Ski Flight Free. And I would uh, recommend you, listener, to to have a think about that. And I think we could continue this conversation a lot, and I'm sure that we will continue it. But, uh, David, that, that's really uh, great just now. Thank you very much for that. We're going to move on to feedback now. I enjoy all feedback about the show. I like to know what people think, uh, especially about our features. Now, Adam Horsfield, he sent in a message saying, I've been an avid listener of the Ski Podcast since 2018. After six years of listening, I've finally taken the decision to take the train to the Alps, and I'm looking forward to it. So, Adam, that fits in with what I've just been talking about. I'm really pleased. It's taken six years. (laughs) Maybe, listener, uh, you can try it uh, quicker than that, but it is really good because we need to change our uh, habits. I have had so much feedback about episode 204 and that was when i interviewed mike gore who's the md of andermatt and discussed Vail resorts and Vail resorts and the epic pass is clearly uh, something that uh, a lot of people feel very strongly about so let's start off with occasional snow reporter simon burgess he said really enjoyed the last episode on the epic pass as someone who's used it a lot it's exciting what's on offer and what could develop I still think some of the partner agreements are a ripoff uh, with special lodging needed to get a pass. That's the case in Verbier. You need to stay in certain places to be able to use the Epic Pass there. But for Andermatt, Three Valleys, Dolomites, it's been brilliant. Honestly, it was fantastic in Andermatt. I took my Epic Pass along, showed it to them, and they gave me a season pass on the spot, which I'm pretty sure is sold for more money than the Epic Pass anyway. That's really interesting to hear from simon there some different views came from andrew brannan he said about Vale resorts and their impact eye watering ticket prices all the top management jobs taken out of resort all the restaurants and hotels shops and even estate agents bought up by the same monopoly aggressive property development workers forced to live down the valley chris howie had a similar theme he said it feels as if Vale Resorts are trying to wring every last penny out of resorts while providing only the very minimum in return. In most of Vale Resorts uh, owned resorts, prices have gone sky high. Only the rich can ski. Ski passes are almost three times the price of a European ski resort. Lift lines are incredibly long. Local staff are removed. It's ripping the heart out of the resort. Chris says very firmly, I will do my best never to ski at a resort owned by the Vale Resort organisation. Uh, Jane Henderson uh, via Twitter uh, said, oh, you should have uh, given him, Mike, or a bit more of a grilling about the negative impact of the Epic Pass. So quite a lot of feedback there. And I was very aware that 
there are these kind of views about uh, Vale Resorts and the Epic Pass. I think it's probably simplistic to say Vale Resorts are bad, the Epic Pass is bad. Uh, but I think it's important to understand and for listeners to, I'm sure, agree that the model is changing. I saw last week that um, over half of American skiers buy either an Epic Pass or an Icon Pass. And in fact, there's something called the Magic Pass available in Switzerland for smaller resorts. It's seen a 9% increase in sales this winter. They have 2 million skier days. David, do you have a, a view on Vail Resort? A couple of comments. I saw the Magic Pass is extending into the Haute, into the Haute Savoie next winter. There's three ski areas that are going to join it. That's a good thing for people who like to get around the place, especially ski these more obscure, smaller resorts, which can be great skiing. You said you're in Verbier. What was their feeling about Vale's overtures to Verbier? Well, that is very interesting. And I specifically asked Mike about you know the rumours surrounding that. And he said, oh, well, they're just rumours. But actually, I was going to segue onto this later. I, I did actually interview Laurent Volche, who is the CEO of Tele Verbier. And, uh, well, let's listen to this clip. Right, I'm here uh, right now with uh, Laurent Volche. Uh, he's the CEO of Tele Verbier. We just had a magnificent lunch looking out over beautiful slopes of Verbier. You've put on fantastic conditions for me. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> We've talked about so many different things in our conversation just now. Sustainability and different changes that you're making to the resort and how things are, you know, are going to progress into the future. But one thing that did crop up is we talked about Vale Resort. So there had been that, that rumour. Uh, that Vale Resorts were interested in buying Verbier and I wondered if you could comment on it. Yeah, that was just a rumour and uh, there was no discussion going on on the acquisition of Verbier by, by Vale Resorts. That couldn't, that couldn't be more clear. I think you had a meeting last Saturday where the major shareholder was there exactly. who also said that he had no intention. There was no discussion going on and no intent to, to sell Verbier. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that's extremely clear. That's great, Laurent. Thank you very much. You're- so... There, Laurent, he is the CEO. He categorically denies that that is going to go ahead. So that's the answer to that question to you, David. (laughs) Catherine, do you have any views on Bell Resort? I think it's something that I'm just very interested in and watching very closely. I was in Andromat last season and actually I'm going to Andromat again tomorrow. So far, the resorts they've invested in, uh, both privately owned, which left them vulnerable to uh, to investment. I I mean, obviously, I'm looking at all the online forums about the Epic Pass and the Icon Pass and how, how, you know, there's overcrowded in US resorts at the weekends when all these season pass holders decide to turn up or when the snow conditions are good. Beyond that, I don't really have a, a, a negative view or a positive one way or the other. Just very interested to see how it develops in Europe. And of course, around the Alps this winter and last winter, we're seeing more American skiers who are actually saving money by coming to Europe to ski. That is definitely true. I uh, was in Chamonix back in January, February, and there were so many Americans there. And I think, you know, you do get a lot of Americans coming over to Europe anyway, but these passes are making a lot of difference. And I'm actually just writing a, a blog post about the Icon Pass for one of my clients at the moment and doing a bit of research into it. And I was just adding up the cost of the uh, passes because you you know depending on which type of pass you can get you get seven days at Zermatt seven days in Chamonix on the Icon Pass as well as unlimited skiing in some of their uh, key resorts as well and that can be amazing value if you're someone who is let's say in the States or in Canada or indeed anywhere in the world because there's various other destinations like uh, Niseko in Japan Australia New Zealand etc all covered within it what's interesting is that this is the the model and there's definitely advantages for ski huge advantages for ski resorts uh, because it brings forward their cash flow to the beginning of the season people are buying the pass it gives them more reliability and we were talking David about the impact of climate change There's a diversification there for a company like Vail Resorts. If the East Coast in the States has a bad winter or California has a bad winter or Colorado has a bad winter, they're kind of covered within that pass. People who are going to ski from the big cities will still have one of their destinations that they can go to. I I learned that Vail Resorts have a 36% market share in the States. That is huge. That's never going to happen in Europe. You know, Catherine, you mentioned that, you know, they've ac- acquired a couple of resorts that are privately owned. And my research suggests that other possible privately owned uh, resorts might be Larks, Sasfe, St. Anton. They're all ones that rumours are around as well as uh, Verbier. But you're never going to get, never going to get in Europe, any of the countries to like a 36% market share, maybe 
people who know Scandinavia, Ski Star own a lot of the resorts uh, up there. That's possibly slightly different. So I don't think that you will find resorts get priced out of normal reach to do with Vail Resorts or something like that. But what David you know, was talking about, as that snow line goes up and places like Verbier, Belterins, uh, Val d'Isere, which have that higher skiing to offer, if you took the assumption that there's a similar demand from skiers who want to go out to the Alps, but there's a smaller supply, it makes sense that prices would go up. That is something we'll only have to find out in due course. And undoubtedly, all of these topics, whether it's the passes like Epic Pass, Icon Pass, Magic Pass, or climate change, we, we've probably covered uh, this podcast is going to be about an hour long. We could easily talk for hours and hours about it, and I'm sure we will cover it uh, again. But with that exclusive from Lauren Volche, categorically denying that a Verbier will be bought by Vail Resorts, we're going to wrap up today. If you like the podcast, I'm just going to ask you to do one thing this week. Just take a minute or two and review us. Uh, That could be giving us five stars, or if you're generous, adding a few words as well, saying why you like the podcast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, any of those, or if that's too tricky, even appreciate a comment on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. We're at Ski Podcast on all of those. Uh, There are 211 episodes to catch up with now, and I, I had a look. 167 were listened to in the last week. There is so much to listen to in our back catalogue. You can just go to theskipodcast.com, search around the tags and categories. You're bound to find something of interest to you. I also looked in the last week, 54% of our listeners were in the UK, uh, 18% were in the States, and uh, that leaves 28%, I think, across the rest of the world. And we had listeners in Mexico, Mauritius, Egypt, and Venezuela uh, in that list. So uh, I'd like to thank all of our listeners wherever you are in the world. Now, you can follow me at Skipedia and the podcast at Ski Podcast. But for now, I would like to thank Intersport for supporting the show. And thank my guest today, Catherine. Thanks, Ian. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure. And David, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And finally, listener, thank you for joining us. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>